If I ask you the question, have you total assurance this morning in the matter of forgiveness? Then I think there'd be a pause in our mind, wouldn't there? Now I notice that when I talk with people in counselling, that what troubles them is a particular sin. Maybe here's a young woman who failed, lost her virginity when she was a teenager, and that's bugged her for the rest of her life. Or here's a young man who's done something dishonourable and he can't get it out of his mind. Or maybe here's a pastor who has morally failed and secrecy and he, and he can't handle that. But what he's looking at is one sin. That woman is looking at one failure. That person is looking at one fault. But when you come to the scriptures, the exposure of the human heart is so deep and so vast that it shows us the absolute innumerable nature of our sins and the interminable depths of our evil. We have actually taken these capacities of love and adoration and we have attached them to a single object which is an idol, which is a person, which is an ambition, which is a thing, which is a relationship. And we have think that, that you know, that God's on the side. And so we think that our idolatry is something about which we can speak lightheartedly. You know, our attachment to material possessions today, our Aussie dream, do you know what I mean, of comfort and affluence. And we think that's, there's nothing wrong about that, nothing culpable, nothing for which we ought to feel guilty. And yet we ought to be soaked through with guilt. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. You know, even while I'm talking to you, I'm aware of my own sinfulness in getting indignant at other people's sins. It's a tremendous thing today to criticize the government and the cricket players and the, everybody who doesn't do anything. We feel so virtuous and good, don't we? Well, true. You know, somehow or another our guilt eases a little, doesn't it? And, and parsons who preach about people's sins, they get a kind of a, a spin-off of a release, you know, for the moment. But it all closes in on us again, doesn't it? Fancy exchanging the truth of God for the lie. That a human being lives all his life in the lie. But, but I ask you, as though we would come to it the first, for the first time, how is it possible in the light of the holiness of God and of the total unremitting irreversible demands of God's holy law, how is it possible that in any way even God could deal with the depthless guilt of one human sin, let alone the entirety of the sins of the world and the sinful nature of man in his opposition to God. Jesus dealing with that woman there and that poor thing she is so mixed up isn't she her body her mind her heart her emotions have got into such a tangle and such a mix that who's ever going to unravel that life and for him to say to her go in peace 
Your faith has saved you. You mean to tell me he's reversed the life of a harlot and made her a virgin? Well, has he? Oh, yes, he has. Does she have to go through months of prayer counseling, uh, healing of the memories, uh, reversal of this and that? Is she she got to go through anger, she's got to relive her experience, she's got to go back into the womb and have fatal experiences? Or has some amazing power reached down into the depths of her heart and utterly, utterly purged her and purified her? If I'd been Peter, and you know, Peter really was a good foot putter, wasn't he? He was always putting his foot in the... always awkward, always making mistakes, you know, just like me. And, and can I say to myself, you know, that's for me too. You see, that's the problem we've got. That's it. And we've got a lot of pain and anguish left over from what I call inadequate evangelism, where people have been told to put their trust in their power of decision and not in the power of the cross. If I could take this little section, which I'm going to do now, from verse 19 through to the end of chapter 3, and show you Paul's reasoning, and, and I think it's absolutely immaculate, impeccable, how God justifies not good church people and not good seekers, but he justifies the ungodly. I think the verse I've come to love more and more in these days is, and I'll say it in the old Anglican translation 1662 prayer book. This is a true saying and worthy of all men to be received that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Beautiful, isn't it? You know, I'm a real applicant for that. You know, you can come to save saints. You can come to save anybody but sinners and the only came for them. So if you're going to be in on the bandwagon, you better be a sinner. You know, <laughs> Be a sinner as quick as you can. <laughs> or you're out in the cold. Why I'm saying that is because my prayer and hope has been that in every study we have, our hearts, not just our minds and our brains, but our hearts will be open to what God is saying to us. And if he's saying to us today, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. That's tremendous, isn't it? Just that. And I know there's probably not one of us who doesn't need that freshly this morning, including myself. That the battle that evil fights against us is to dissuade us from the simple reality that our sins are forgiven.